Hi, and welcome to the fourth webinar in our series, Lunch, Learn, and Dance, Health Effects of Exposure to Radiation. In this session, we will overview the health effects of ionizing and non-ionizing radiation. My name is Lynn McDonald, and I will be the presenter for this portion of the webinar. I will be joined by Angelo de Torres at 12.30 Eastern, and he will lead us in dance. Also joining me is Tara Hargraves, who will help monitor the chat. Let's take a moment to go over the functionality of the Zoom webinar. The audio and video will be from the presenters only. We have found that although you can access the audio through the computer or telephone, the quality of sound tends to be better when listening from a computer. There is a chat feature where people can discuss. If you would like, take a moment now and say hello and where you're from. If you have questions arriving from the content, please enter them under the Q&A section as the webinar is only half hour in length and is immediately followed by our dance session, time may not permit me to answer them during the webinar. The answers will be posted on our website, along with a link to the video recording and a copy of the slides. This can be found under Education Webinars. I will be sending a confirmation of attendance email after the webinar and will include a link to that page with that communication. I will also include the topics covered and the length of time spent in the webinar, as some people have requested this to send to the professional association. Lastly, I have automatic closed captioning enabled in the slide presentation. If they're being blocked by your Zoom controls, you should be able to select a different way to view the webinar in Zoom, which makes them easier to see. This webinar is intended to provide an overview of some of the potential health effects associated with exposure to radiation. For further details on different aspects of radiation, please see other webinars in the series. The topics to be covered in this module include an introduction to radiation interactions with matter, radiation dose, and the health effects of radiation on people. We will look at the effects for both ionizing and non-ionizing radiation. We will wrap up with how this information is determined, who our regulators are, and how to find out more information. Physicists studied the interaction of matter and energy. Matter is made up of small particles called atoms. All matter has mass and takes up space. Energy is the ability to create change in matter. All matter, whether at rest or in motion, has energy. When energy is transferred out in straight lines from a source, we call it radiation. It can take the form of beams of particles or waves. It is the energy that we use to do work for us. It is also the energy that has the ability to cause harm. Radiation will interact differently with matter depending upon what type of radiation it is and how much energy it carries. The atom is made up of three types of particles. The proton, which is positively charged, the neutron, which is neutral, and the electron, which is negatively charged. Protons and neutrons strongly bond together to form the nucleus of the atom and the electrons orbit around it. For radiation to deposit its energy into material, it must interact with it in some way. If the radiation carries enough energy, it can knock one or more electrons out of their orbit around the nucleus. Matter has a tendency to move towards stable, low energy states. As a result, atoms will typically either be electrically neutral or form molecules that are electrically neutral. An electrically charged atom is called an ion. When radiation has enough energy to knock electrons from orbit, it is called ionizing radiation. Radiation that does not have enough energy to remove electrons from their orbits is called non-ionizing radiation. We will first discuss the properties and health effects of ionizing radiation and then move on to non-ionizing radiation. There are two sources of ionizing radiation, radioactive atoms and man-made devices. We have already mentioned what atoms are. They have a nucleus made up of protons and neutrons and have electrons orbiting around the nucleus. Most atoms in nature have a stable nucleus. In other words, a nucleus which will stay intact forever. Some atoms also have unstable nucleus, one that will emit radiation or energy to try to become stable. We can also build machines to produce ionizing radiation without the use of radioactive atoms. Examples are X-ray units, including CT scanners and particle accelerators. There are several types of ionizing radiation. 
alpha particles, beta particles, and gamma rays are all emitted from the nuclei of radioactive atoms. Neutrons are liberated during the fission or breaking apart of large atoms like uranium. X-rays are produced by machines. All of these types of radiation have enough energy to knock electrons out of their orbit from around the nucleus of the atom. When radiation interacts with matter, it deposits some or all of its energy into it. The amount of radiation transferred is called a dose. There are several ways dose is measured. A common unit of radiation dose is the sievert. It considers the amount of energy deposited in a kilogram of material and how biologically damaging it is. One sievert is a large dose. Radiation dose is usually reported in millisieverts. The tissues, organs, and cells in the bodies of living animals, including human beings, are made up of atoms. When radiation strikes a living being, it can interact with the atoms in the body. In principle, the interaction of radiation with living material is the same as with that of non-living material. The basic unit of life is the cell. Inside the cell are structures called chromosomes. They carry instructions for life processes, including replication. This information is encoded in smaller parts of the chromosomes called genes. These structures are made up of a complex molecule called DNA. The interaction of radiation with a cell depends upon the energy and intensity of the radiation, as well as the length of time of the exposure. When radiation interacts with DNA, it could cause ionization and break bonds within the DNA molecule. While the body has processes to repair such damage, if repaired incorrectly, such a break could potentially change these instructions encoded in the genes. This is called a mutation. Mutations are not guaranteed to happen. When ionizing radiation interacts with a cell, there are several different outcomes which can occur. There could be no damage at all, there could be damage that is then repaired by the cell, and there could be damage which leads to cell death. This may sound bad, but unless this happens in large amounts, it is not of concern as cells routinely die in small numbers. Ionizing radiation could also lead to an alteration to cell chromosomes that is incorrectly repaired, a mutation. When they do occur, these cell mutations could have no noticeable effect or lead to hereditary or somatic effects. Hereditary or genetic effects are those which might affect future generations as a result of our exposure to ionizing radiation. For this to happen, the ionizing radiation would need to interact with the DNA in an egg or sperm cell in such a way to cause a mutation. This mutated DNA would then be used to conceive a child. Expected effects of such a mutation would be leukemia or developmental delays. Hereditary effects have been demonstrated in laboratory animals, but have not been found in humans. Somatic effects are those experienced by the person who was exposed to the radiation. This would include a child who was already conceived but not yet born. Remember, one possibility of exposing a cell to ionizing radiation is a mutation. Not all mutations affect the cell, but some can lead to the cell not knowing how to properly replicate. When a cell undergoes uncontrolled replication, it creates a tumor. When a tumor is a type that will invade other tissues or spread to other parts of the body, it is called malignant or cancer. The word stochastic is used to describe an event that increases in frequency under certain conditions, but you cannot ensure it will happen under those conditions. Radiation exposure increases the likelihood of developing cancer. The greater the exposure, the greater the likelihood, but we cannot be certain that an effect will or will not occur. For that reason, we call it a stochastic effect. Another commonly recognized stochastic effect is smoking causing cancer. We know that smoking causes lung cancer, but Joe smoked 60 a day and lived to be 95. Some people develop lung cancer in their life anyway. Only some of these people are smokers. Smoking increases the likelihood of developing lung cancer. But if someone gets lung cancer, we cannot directly say that the lung cancer was caused by a certain cigarette. This is a stochastic effect. The risk of developing a fatal cancer as a result 
of exposure to radiation is approximately 4% per thousand millisieverts. Consider a person who worked 50 years and received 20 millisieverts per year. This person's total lifetime radiation dose is 1,000 millisieverts. This person will have an extra 4% chance of developing a fatal cancer. In Canada, approximately 25% of people develop a fatal cancer in their life. So the risk of developing a fatal cancer to the person who received 20 millisievert dose of radiation a year for 50 years becomes 29% instead of 25. Other professions carry risks too. How does this compare? Studies are done to determine the risk of death from different occupations and professions. As you can see, the risk for a nuclear energy worker who would have an exposure limit that averages over five years to 20 millisievert of radiation per year would be similar to the risk for those working in mining. Please note that while the limit for nuclear energy workers in Canada is an average 20 millisieverts per year over five years with no one year going over 50, regulation also states that the levels must be kept as low as reasonably achievable. Those who work as a nuclear energy worker typically have doses averaging at 0.2 millisieverts per year. As a comparison, here are some figures for risk of death due to accidents as compared to deaths from exposure to the maximum allowable annual dose to ionizing radiation to a member of the public over and above natural background radiation. The maximum emission limit from the nuclear facilities in Canada and the average emission from nuclear facilities in Canada. As opposed to a stochastic effect, a deterministic effect is one which will definitely occur when radiation exposure has exceeded a certain threshold. An example of a deterministic effect is a radiation burn or the development of cataracts. When talking about deterministic effects, doses are typically reported in gray or milligray, which is a measure solely of the amount of energy deposited per kilogram without consideration of radio, radiation or tissue type. Deterministic effects do not occur below acute exposures of approximately 250 milligray. With an acute radiation exposure of 250 milligray, one might begin to observe temporary changes in the blood cell counts within a few days. To observe a radiation burn, one would have to receive an acute radiation exposure of approximately 5 gray. This is a very large dose. The symptoms of radiation sickness are seen in patients undergoing radiation treatments for cancer. These people are exposed to high doses of radiation concentrated in the area of the tumor in order to try and kill the cancerous cells. But the side effects of these high doses of radiation are things like hair loss, nausea and vomiting, fatigue, and general malaise. It is highly unlikely that anyone working with radioactive materials or nuclear devices in Canada would receive occupational radiation doses high enough to cause deterministic effects. Individuals in Canada working with nuclear materials or radiation devices receive chronic low exposures to radiation Possible deterministic effects of this type of exposure would be cataracts and nonspecific life shortening, whereas possible stochastic effects would be cancer or hereditary effects, although hereditary effects have not been seen in humans. Acute exposures are uncommon, but can still occur in the event of an accident or if radiation safety procedures are not followed. As indicated, deterministic effects are not generally observed below an acute dose of 250 milligray. Changes in the blood counts will occur at a dose of 250 milligray. Damage to the skin and hair loss can occur at three to five gray. Acute doses of three and a half to five gray can result in sterility. Acute doses of 0.5 gray can cause nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. Radiation doses leading to illness or death would only occur in the event of a severe accident involving a very large dose of radiation. These accidents are rare and subject to thorough investigation. We are all constantly exposed to some form of radiation or another. We live in a radioactive world and it has been so since the beginning of time. 
We are continually exposed to high energy radiation from outer space called cosmic radiation. We are also exposed from the radiation emitted from naturally occurring radionuclides in Earth. In fact, the air we breathe, the water we drink, and the food we eat all contain trace amounts of radionuclides. We are also exposed to radiation during certain medical procedures. This background radiation exposure gives Canadians approximately two to four millisieverts of ionizing radiation dose per year. If we compare this exposure to the maximum amount of occupational exposure a non-nuclear energy worker is allowed to get in one year, one millisievert, we can see how strict the national limit is. Here are some exposures which might typically occur to an average Canadian as compared with the regulatory dose limits. Recipients of medical radiation doses are not subject to the regulatory exposure limits it is, as it is up to the medical practitioner to balance the risks associated with the procedure with the need for imaging and treatment. Up until this point, we have been discussing health effects of exposure to ionizing radiation. We will now look at forms of non-ionizing radiation, radio waves, microwaves, infrared, visible light, and low energy ultraviolet. Although they have not been shown to cause cancer, these forms of non-ionizing radiation do have other known possible health effects. Many types of radiation produce thermal effects or heating. We all have a general idea of what we mean by temperature. We can feel when something is hot or cold, or we measure it with a thermometer. Temperature is a measure of how much movement there is in the atoms and molecules of a material its thermal energy. Heat is transferring thermal energy from one area to another. When an object is heated, its molecules move around more. This could cause changes in physical properties, such as a change of state. When molecules have more thermal energy, they're more able to engage in chemical reactions. Burning, a reaction between a fuel and oxygen, is one such chemical reaction which can happen. Proteins are large molecules that form shapes which allow them to perform some function within a living system. When heated past a certain point, their shape breaks down and they can no longer perform that function. This is called denaturing. This process can be irreversible and can lead to cell death. Heating a living being can also affect the rates of their metabolic reactions. Chemical reactions need to have a certain amount of energy to, available to occur, called activation energy. For some chemical reactions, this energy is low enough that the chemical reaction will occur without an external input of energy. Others require additional energy. For example, burning can occur due to the thermal energy provided from heating. Generally speaking, photochemical effects are those which occur due to an input of energy in the form of light in the infrared, visible, and ultraviolet ranges. Examples include photosynthesis, the formation of vitamin D in humans, creating long molecules called polymers, along with cross-linking of these polymer chains, the degradation of materials such as plastics when exposed to light, uh, the degradation of some nutrients and dyes when exposed to light, and photoreception in the eye. Low frequency electromagnetic radiation, those under 100 hertz, are common around power lines. As with other electromagnetic radiation, these can generate electric fields within the body that interfere with the body's own electric fields. At low energy levels, these are mostly unnoticeable. At higher levels, they might give a sensation of a faint light flicker in the peripheral vision, an effect on the skin that feels like a static buildup of charge or a tingling sensation. At very high levels, they can have irreversible, irreversible cardiovascular effects or cause burns. To date, research has not shown that chronic exposure to low level, low frequency electromagnetic radiation has any detrimental effects on health. Radio frequency is the part of the electromagnetic spectrum in the 100 kilohertz to 300 gigahertz in frequency. 
It is used in telecommunications, including mobile phones, base stations, Wi-Fi, 5G, radio and television, MRI equipment, and microwave ovens. By overviewing several decades of research, studies have found the health effects of concern with radio frequency electromagnetic radiation are due to heating of exposed tissue. Above a threshold, this can lead to heat stroke or burns. Lasers produce a beam of light, usually in the visible range, but also into infrared or UV, in which all the light is of the same wavelength, which is called being in phased, and travels in the same direction. As a result, it carries that energy without dissipating significantly due to spreading. Beams of laser light are not visible in clean air and can easily be reflected. If you are working around lasers above a certain power level, around five milliwatts, there are health effects of concern due to burns. But the beam could also start a fire or generate airborne hazards. It is important when working with lasers, which can damage tissues, to understand the path of the beam, wear all appropriate PPE, to remove all reflective articles such as jewelry, and consider your non-beam hazards. Ultraviolet radiation is a form of electromagnetic radiation. It is slightly higher in frequency than visible light and its photons carry more energy. The UV spectrum is divided into three categories in increased frequency and photon energy, UVA, UVB, and UVC. Sunlight is a major source of UV light along with equipment made for this purpose. The ozone layer in the atmosphere protects us from a great deal of the high energy UVB and all of the UVC radiation from the sun. Depending upon the energy level of the photons, ultraviolet light can have heating, photoelectric, or ionizing effects. These effects can manifest differently depending upon whether the exposure is acute, which is a large amount of energy in a short time frame, or chronic which is lower amounts of energy over a long period of time. Possible acute effects include sunburns, increased melanin production or tanning, vitamin D production, local immunosuppression, eye inflammation, and retinal damage. Chronic effects include skin wrinkling, skin aging, skin cancer, and damage to the eye, including cataracts, retinal degeneration, and eye cancer. How radiation affects living tissue has been and continues to be an area of scientific research. Studies can be in the form of computer simulations using cells in an artificial condition, which is called in vitro studies, in living organisms, which is called in vivo studies, or in conditions very similar to living conditions, but not within a living organism, which is an in situ study. There's also research done by looking at populations of humans, which are epidemiological studies. For example, the survivors of the atomic bombs in Hiroshima and Nagasaki have been studied to understand the long-term effects of this exposure. And this information has been used to inform radiation protection guidelines. More detail on the global organizations responsible for radiation protection will be given in our April 1st webinar regulatory bodies and international agencies. In general, for low frequency radiation, guidelines attempt to keep induced currents below that which naturally occurs in the body. For radio, microwave and infrared frequency, they consider what is needed to prevent effects due to heating. For visible and UV, they additionally consider how to prevent negative photochemical effects. Ionizing radiation regulations, whether it be particle radiation or high energy electromagnetic, must keep exposures low enough to prevent acute effects and keep chronic ex exposures as low as reasonably achievable. When, de when developing exposure guidelines, threshold levels are considered and then lowered by a safety factor to take into account any effects not yet found in research. For one example, the International Commission on Non-Ionizing Radiation Protection, or ICNIRP, has determined threshold values for behavioral changes in animals exposed to electromagnetic fields 
as these behavioral changes occur at much lower levels than what are known to cause any adverse health effects. They then divide these by a safety factor of 10 for occupational guidelines and a factor of 50 for public exposures. This means that it recommends occupational levels 10 times lower than any threshold for animal behavioral effects and 50 times lower for members of the public. Regulators often use the findings of research scientists and guidelines set by international and governmental agencies when developing dose limits and developing regulations for other aspects of radiation protection, for example, in shielding design or in setting acceptable levels of radon in enclosed spaces. The Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission, or CNSC, is the regulating body in Canada responsible for protecting the health, safety, and security of Canadians as well as protecting the environment in relation to radioactive sources. They oversee the mining, processing, manufacture, use, storage, transport, and disposal of nuclear materials and radiation devices. Under the current regulations, radiation devices containing nuclear sources must be certified by the CNSC in order to be sold and possessed. Unless the device contains an extremely small quantity of nuclear material, the owner must have a license from the CNSC. The CNSC also regulates very high energy X-ray units, such as linear accelerators, which are used to produce radioactive materials and in medicine to treat cancers. All lower energy X-ray units, for example, most medical X-ray units, CT scanners, baggage X-ray units, and units used in manufacturing and industry are regulated provincially. You can visit our website to find more information on all provincial regulations. We hope you have enjoyed this introduction to the health effects of exposure to radiation. Founded in 1980, the Radiation Safety Institute of Canada is an independent not-for-profit organization offering a variety of informational consultation and laboratory services focused on radiation safety. If you have further questions about ionizing or non-ionizing radiation, please feel free to contact us toll free at 1-800-263-5803 or by email at info at radiationsafety.ca. Visit us on the web at www.radiationsafety.ca or find us on Facebook.